Who is Lennox Lewis the boxer? Interesting. He presents as formidable a picture as there is in the heavyweight division. Yeah. He has the ability to do everything. He's among the great curiosities of boxing, a fighter with a hulking physique and fists full of thunder, who's flirted with opportunities, but never punched his way to the top of the heavyweight division. The other knock on Lewis? When he fights, you rarely know what you'll get. Will he scrape and claw like a British bulldog? Or, as was the case in his loss to Oliver McCall, will he be nothing more than an English muffin? No one could be as good a fighter as Lennox Lewis thinks he is. It's, it's, it's impossible. If he's half as good as he thought he was, he'd be Joe Lewis. I think that helps me in the sense of having a lot of criticism because it helps motivate me because it wants me to prove them wrong. I'm always proving them wrong and they're getting paid $12 an hour. I'm getting paid millions. But getting paid millions will never erase the questions which surround Lewis. After the McCall fight, in which he suffered his first loss as a professional, Lennox made a strategic change, bringing in Emmanuel Stewart as his trainer. In the first Lewis McCall fight, Stewart had stood in Oliver's corner. So now as he looks for redemption, Lennox can take from Stewart a unique understanding of his only professional loss. Lennox, he first came in the ring for the fight, he had a very confident look in his face, but it seemed like he was kind of still bewildered by the intensity that he saw in Oliver McCall. I was really hyper about the fight. I just wanted to go out there and just hit him and uh, explode with my right hand. Our entire strategy was based around Lennox Lewis's right hand which we knew he would throw. We were throwing a lot of left hooks, mainly to make Lennox twist his body over to his left, which would be to McCall's right, for eventually he would catch him with the right hand. Lewis misses with the right. McCall gets a right hand to the body inside. If the first round is a prototype, so far it's a good one for Oliver McCall. Lennox Lewis hasn't really established anything in round one. Oliver came to the corner, I said, so you're just barely missing him with that left hook, right hand combination. When he jams out, you know, you're blocking him, you're throwing a hook, right. keep doing it, because it's not landing, but it's moving him out of we'll balance. Short right That's hand right, out. but you're moving him out of yeah. balance when you throw that shot, okay? And in Lennox's corner, to our advantage, his trainer was telling him to just go out and get this bum out. Stay on the stick, keep it in the circle. When he's inside, try to catch him with the uppercut coming in. I think that was the wrong advice to give me at that point. Going into the second round, Lennox Lewis had been instructed to just come out and knock out Oliver as if he was just a, a nobody. I just wanted to throw that right hand and I basically uh, committed myself and helped Oliver McCall punch me on the chin. Now that uh, they're going to fight again, I believe that Lennox will come in much better prepared than he was the last fight. Lennox Lewis will win. He will not step into no right hands. He'll definitely uh, go out there and do the job, and, and he's learned from his mistake. This fight means a lot to him personally because he's fighting the only man that's beaten him and who knocked him out and took a championship. If Lennox can look very impressive in this fight, I think the public would then almost force a fight between Lennox and one of the big names. So it's not just important to win this fight, but we need to win it and look very impressive in it. If Lennox Lewis genuinely wants to return to the top, he must be impressive in his rematch with McCall. And as he focuses on his future, the memory of the first fight drives him toward the redemption he so desperately desires. Being called champ is great. It's a great feeling. It's like crowning, you're the king. It was a great feeling raising up the belt. And now, having the opportunity to do it again, it's going to be an even greater feeling to know that I've accomplished it twice. We're minutes away from the rematch as Lennox Lewis and Oliver McCall go through final preparations in their dressing rooms, getting ready to come into the ring against each other for the second time, this time live from Las Vegas. Once again with Larry Merchant and Larry, uh, Oliver McCall all but closed his eyes, wound up, fired a big right hand, landed, and suddenly held a heavyweight championship of the world. A lot of water under the bridge since then, but in effect, the question has to be, was that one great lucky punch or the kind of thing that could happen again? Jim, when one guy throws a punch in boxing and the other guy gets his jaw in the way, that's just boxing. I compare it to a professional songwriter who has one big hit song, Frankie Lyman and Why Do Fools Fall in Love. One swing can change your career in boxing, unlike most other games. The question tonight is, 
does McCall have a second big hit in him? And if he does, mm -hmm. how will Lewis respond to it? Certainly he didn't respond as well as he might have liked to in the first fight, which brings up the psychological question, George, as to who holds the upper hand here. Is Oliver McCall, as the result of his one great punch against Lennox Lewis, always going to hold the psychological, the psychological advantage over Lewis, or is that now erased? No, it happens in the amateur all the time. One guy faces the, the one fella, then he recovers and he makes a tour around the country in a rematch, and he wins. He beats the guy who knocks him out. Uh, Lennox Lewis have had the opportunity of, of a year to go by, enough time to recover, recoup, and get his uh, confidence back. He's been hit by heavier punches, and he maintained his pause. He didn't panic. So I think that the idea of the last fight is totally wiped out now. This is a whole new day. Well, Oliver McCall is a man who's always looking for a whole new day <laughs> because in his multi-problematic life, going into the ring and fighting is a refuge for him. His bigger battles are always outside the ring. It's one thing to act a little bit crazy because then you're cloaked in mystery. You become an interesting character if you have a little bit of an air of, of danger. But it's an entirely different thing to be crazy. He's a little crazy. It's been almost two and a half years since Oliver McCall stunned Lennox Lewis and became a heavyweight titleist. Today, McCall struggles with the same problems he's faced most of his life. Drug and alcohol abuse and run-ins with the law. Oliver McCall denied an interview to HBO Sports, but many boxing writers were willing to help tell his story. Oliver's troubles began in childhood on the streets of Chicago. He was a street kid who had some of the problems that a lot of guys uh, uh, have when they grow up in, in a big city and in difficult circumstances. You know, got involved in uh, taking things that weren't his and, uh, you know, all those kinds of uh, things that you quite often find. And boxing kind of saved him, I think, to some degree. He would go to spar with Tyson, and it was funny because he was the only guy who, who was, appeared to be happy to be there. In the ring, McCall was seen as a workhorse, not a contender. But from 1991 to 1994, he gradually moved up in the rankings and was given his title shot in late 94 against Lewis. Before training for that fight, Oliver was rumored to have been in drug rehab. At the fight in London, he was kept under close watch. They set up training camp 35, 40 miles outside of London because they did not want him in a situation where he could slip away and come back at 4 o'clock in the morning. And it drove him crazy. You have to really clamp down on this guy because uh, he's a little bit of a loose cannon. Still, McCall won. Emmanuel Stewart, chosen to train him for Lewis, denied any stories of drug abuse while they were together. Before I'd got involved with uh, Oliver, I'd heard a lot of things about his past, but I never experienced him. And, and he developed a respect for me as a father, like, and I think that's why I was so effective with him. I found Oliver to be a, a very extremely intelligent person. He's a, a gifted all-around athlete also. But after that victory, Stewart left McCall for Lewis, citing differences not with McCall, but with his camp. Oliver then lost his title to Frank Bruno in September 1995 and was arrested three times last year. In April, possession of marijuana in North Carolina. In July, the police found crack and marijuana while Oliver drove down a bike path in Chicago. In December, at a hotel in Nashville, Oliver threw a Christmas tree and spat at police. He's trying to, uh, you know, be a, a cat with nine lives, so to speak, and he's testing him. He's losing, and he's taking a lot of chances. He thinks that he can get away with certain things, and he thinks nobody's kind of looking. You know, how many times do you have to go through that to get the message? This time, it's no secret McCall was put into drug rehab only eight weeks before tonight. Supposedly, he's also been training at the same time. I'm just not really sure how you can do that. You know, there's some people that everything is a distraction to. There's some people that nothing, you know, for whom nothing is a distraction because uh, either they have very intense concentration or else they don't give a damn. And I think Oliver probably falls in the second category. The reality is that Oliver McCall has much more at stake than just his boxing career. He's a husband and the father of seven children. Yes children that, that uh, he loves and they love him and it's time to take care of, of that situation and stop worrying about boxing and, and, and money and all these other things that apparently overwhelm him. Because if he keeps going this way, uh, they're only going to be able to visit him evenings from 
seven to nine. And that's a choice he will have made for himself. I wonder if winning the fight could be the worst thing that could happen to Oliver McCall. Maybe he needs to lose and realize it's over and get on with his life. If your life's not in, in control and you become heavyweight champ of the world again, you move that much closer to falling off the edge. It may be that one day Oliver McCall can continue fighting and clean up his life, but it hasn't happened yet. Tonight he battles Lennox Lewis. Tomorrow he continues a fight which is probably still bigger than he will acknowledge. And we bring you back live in the arena for the tale of the tape between Lennox Lewis and Oliver McCall, both 31 years old. Lewis with a two and a half inch height advantage. Highest weight of Lewis's career, also the highest weight of McCall's career, and Lewis's reach, a two inch advantage there. Larry? Lewis wants to uh, uh, blame his weight on the fact that he has grown an inch. I think that if you believe that, I could probably sell you some Oceanside real estate here in Las Vegas. Sell us the punch stat numbers instead. <laughs> this is a two fight average of their most recent fights. You can see how active they are. McCall who has never been knocked down is not a very active fighter normally. Now we will go to the jabs and we will see that Lewis has a distinct advantage there which tells us why Lewis should have won the first fight and didn't. Will the numbers be in his side tonight? Lewis also a heavy betting favorite here in Las Vegas to win this fight. Harold Letterman with the rules of the bout. The Lennox Lewis Oliver McCall fight is scheduled for 12 rounds. There is no standing gate count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight, and you can be saved by the bell in the 12th and final round only. Jim. And Lennox Claudius Lewis makes his way toward the ring. Longest layoff of his career. Only one fight, Larry, in the past 15 months of Lewis's life. And I, my guess is that has contributed more to his present weight than anything else. Uh, I know George believes that if you can make a change as he did after coming back to the ring 10 years later, that he can use it to his advantage. We haven't seen that Lewis has been able to make that change so far. You think he can, George? No doubt about it. He just got to think big, act big, and fight big. If you think small and you're big, you won't be able to do it. You just got to think of yourself as the giant and be in control. I like a fighter when he's at near his benchmark weight, when he is quick, has stamina. I don't know of any case we're adding that much weight in this short a period of time has really helped a top heavyweight. We've looked long and hard through boxing records to find another case where a trainer trained one fighter in a championship fight in any weight class and then came back to train the other fighter in a championship rematch. But that is the case for Emmanuel Stewart tonight as far as we can tell. It has never happened before. The record for Lennox Lewis, 29 wins, one loss. That was to McCall. A lot of people thought that Lewis should have lost his last outing in May of 1996 against Ray Mercer in New York. He eked out a very close decision in that 10-rounder, took a lot of punishment en route to winning the fight. And now Oliver McCall, who won a coin flip, and I say won the coin flip because he has the right to come out second and now can make Lewis wait in the ring, has so far made no indication to us that he's going to come out of that dressing room. So, Despite the fact that he knocked out Lewis, he is a three to one underdog, largely because he looked lethargic beating the 45-year-old Larry Holmes and looked like he had slipped himself a Mickey when he lost the title to Bruno. But he may be one of those fighters who fights better as a challenger when there's something to win than as a champion when there's something to defend. You've known those kind of guys, haven't you, George? Yeah, sometimes it's easier to get yourself all worked up when there's something out there to gain. When you get it, figure you only have something to lose. It's not easy to fight like that. Very few fighters can do it. 
If you saw the fight in London, September of 1994, you might remember how wildly worked up McCall was as he made his way toward the ring that night. He's an emotional guy to begin with. Well, it sure looks like he wants to fight. Well, he decided not to make Lewis wait after all as he runs into the ring with his various entourage members trailing behind. And here's the record for Oliver McCall, who seemed to be throwing a punch at Larry Merchant as he came up the stairs into the ring. 28 wins, six losses, no draws, 20 KOs. McCall has never been knocked out. I ducked it, Jim. <laughs> and now let's go up to Michael Buffer, the ring announcer who doesn't duck anything. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Las Vegas Hilton, where tonight, main events, in association with your undisputed, undefeated king of beers, Budweiser. This Bud's for you. Present 12 rounds of boxing for the vacant WBC Heavyweight Championship of the world. This bout is sanctioned by the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Chairman Dr. Elias Ghanem, Commissioners Nat Carasali, Lorenzo Fertitta, Luther Mack, and Dr. James Nave. Executive Director Mark Ratner. Physicians at ringside, lead physician Dr. Flip Homansky. Attending physicians Dr. James Wishgame, Dr. Al Cabana, and Dr. Robert Voy. The timekeepers at the bell and counting for the knockdown seconds will be Jane Broadfoot and Mike Lachella. This contest also, of course, is sanctioned by the World Boxing Council. President at ringside tonight, Jose Suleiman, WBC Supervisor, Edward Thangaraja. The three judges scoring the contest on the 10-point must system will be Anik Hungtungkam, Larry O'Connell, and Galby Shirley. And when the bell rings, the man in charge of the action, your referee, Mills Lane. And now for the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. From the Las Vegas Hilton, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! In the blue corner, wearing black, weighing 237 pounds, he brings a professional record of 28 victories, 20 by knockout against six losses. This evening, he plans a return to glory by proving his victory over two and a half years ago against the man he now faces was not a fluke. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Windy City, Chicago, Illinois, introducing the WBC number two ranked heavyweight contender, the former WBC world heavyweight champion, the Atomic Bull, Oliver McCoy. And across the ring in the red corner, wearing white trimmed with a Union Jack, weighing 251 pounds. He's a 1988 Olympic gold medal winner, who now, as a professional, has a record of 29 victories, 24 by knockout, with only one defeat. And tonight, he has the chance to regain this title by avenging that lone loss on his record. From East London, England, presenting the number one ranked WBC heavyweight contender, former WBC heavyweight champion of the world, Lennox Hughes. All right, hey, no, hey, hey, no, step back. Hey, now look. Here you go. Now, just a minute. There you go, that's right. Oh, wait a minute, Greg. M Manny, if he goes right there, I'm not going to call it low, all right? No problem. We've already gone through the instruction. This is for the title. 
I expect a tough, clean fight. Protect yourself at all times. Any questions no from Mr. Lewis's corner? No problem, no problem. Mr. McCall's corner. Let's get it on! Jim, you might call this the civil trial after the criminal trial. Let's see if the verdict is any different in a new venue with a new set of jurors. And speaking of the venue, a three-year absence from the major boxing scene for the Las Vegas Hilton. But you may remember some of the times you've been here in the past. For Leon Spinks' upset of Muhammad Ali in 1978. Michael Spinks' upset of Larry Holmes in 1986. The night that Mike Tyson knocked out Trevor Burbick to become the youngest heavyweight champion ever, that was here. Julio Cesar Chavez's dramatic 12th round KO of Meldrick Taylor behind on the scorecards. That was here as well. Round one begins. Emmanuel Stewart said that he expected Lewis to be tentative for the first few rounds of this fight until he shakes off the memories of his loss to McCall in 1994. The memories of that one punch. Stewart goes on to point out that Lennox is by nature a cautious counterpuncher at the beginning of his fights anyway. Amid all of his turbulent emotions the last time around, McCall effectively followed the fight plan put forth by Stewart. Does he have another plan tonight? In the early going of the first fight, there was such a look of intensity on McCall's face. It looked like he was in labor. He's been much calmer coming into this round. Come on, let's go, come on. Mills Lane asking McCall not to jump on top of Lewis and try to maul him as he's done a couple of times early on. What about Lennox Lewis's jab, George Foreman? Let's face it, Lennox Lewis can win this fight with just his left hand. If he settles down and just uses his left hand, he won't have any problems at all. Just keep his right hand at home until it, until it creates itself. From long reach, he can do it. Lewis has a long-standing tendency to paw with the jab or to hold it out there and leave it there. Is it getting any better? Well, he's got that reach, and when you have a reach like that and a power like that, you can do anything you want, so long as you're not breaking the rule. That time he hooked after faking the jab, the hook off the jab. And I got to say that now that we see Lewis in the ring with trunks on, 251 doesn't look bad on him. Well, he's got a great body. There's no doubt about that. He can conceal it. Trunks are a little high. When you have that much reach, Lewis can have Oliver McCall slinging and going wild all night and not be able to reach his head if he just stands back, uses his reach. Good body punch by McCall. And when you're 250 pounds, you don't want to be hitting the body much. of a feeling out round for Lewis. Call made some noise early and has been largely acquiescent in the last two minutes of the round. McCall jumped on Lennox Lewis, which played right into Lewis's hand. Here you saw the very eager McCall leaping into the ring before the fight, he didn't seem that eager Listen, during the first the round. Use the jab, use the jab, you'll hit the guy with something. Don't run in, Oliver, because this guy's trying to set you up. He's jabbing, he's out jabbing you. Right, okay. But you got to out jab him. Okay. Let's take your time, then you'll hit him. Don't be anxious trying to hit him with nothing big. Just use the jab, you'll see the big shot. You understand? Now, but stay on top of the guy. Keep him going back. Don't you go back, because this guy can't fight too well going back. He can't throw punches. Mm -hmm. But if you let him come yeah, forward, oh, if, out. if you Seconds let him come out. forward, go. he's going to be able to hit you. Come on, Manny. 
George Benton asking Oliver McCall for more aggression, saying Lewis can't fight if he's going backward. McCall was unable to make Lewis go backward in an effective way in the first round, and Lewis comes out and establishes that pumping jab at the beginning of round two. 49 of Lewis's 57 thrown punches in the first round were jabs. He didn't land but 10 of them, but he set the tempo early. Yeah, you know, Lewis has got to be patient, of course. He's going to be a little reluctant because of the earlier fight in that right hand. Let this guy rush him. He's, his corner told him to charge, Lewis, but you never want to follow and charge a puncher around. That's when you get yourself hurt. Come on, quick grab it. Come on, I'm going to quick grab it. You want to make a puncher chase you because he's not effective going forward. And as McCall threw two wild overhand rights, you saw how wary of that punch Lewis is. Now, there's a good stiff jab by McCall inside, his best punch of the fight so far. And Lewis demonstrates exactly what Benton talked about, doesn't throw punches when he backs up and opens himself up by dropping his hands. Instead of coming in and clutching or punching, he backs up and leaves himself open. Hard right hand by Lewis. And he just misses an uppercut that might have done even more damage. So Lennox Lewis begins to throw the right and takes advantage of the charging McCall with that uppercut. Yes, on this occasion, rather than backing up, he threw the uppercut when, when McCall was charging him. And McCall ducks his head and looks away as Lewis misses over his right hand. Lewis suddenly finding something with the uppercut here in the second round. That's going to slow down McCall's charges, although here McCall gets to him with a left and a right. This one knows two. 250 pounds start working against you. You can't just bump up into a guy with that much weight all night and not start feeling it, the results on your body. Call trying to land the right hand over the top again. This time Lewis blocks one and fires his own right hand. Lewis definitely looks gun shy when McCall releases the right, but aside from those moments, he's getting the better of Oliver. Now, this is what you call backing up. Lewis is doing a good job of backing up. Uh, really, you call when he was back, he was running backwards. That's not backing up. But he's fighting a good go, fight, on, moving on, back. On, go, Another uppercut lands in there for Lewis as round two comes to a close. A round largely dominated by Lennox Lewis's uppercuts. Okay, you got to keep your right hand up. Your right hand is getting a little sloppy, okay? Keep your right hand up and start getting to him a little bit first, okay? You got to finish the second round. You got to start breaking at him a little bit more. You let him initiate a little too much. Now, yeah, break it in, but you got to start a little faster. Your hands are coming from too long, okay? And the boy's nothing but a, if you want to look at his family, you want to see how bad he looks. Anytime he's running, you're running with his eyes down, but don't go to the rope. Try to go in a circle and keep your hands up. George, is he throwing this uppercut correctly or from inside or is he too far outside? Well, this is a big man. He's way up there. He'll never be able to throw a perfect uppercut because he's coming from so, his arms have got to go down to the level of his opponent. So, and there you saw a good right hand later in the round. It's going to, it's going to turn out a bolo no matter right what. By Blundstedt numbers in the first two rounds, Lennox Lewis has virtually doubled Oliver McCall's punch output. McCall releasing 57 punches. Lewis throwing 111. 91 of those punches counted by our punch stat numbers figures were jabs. Lewis criticized throughout his career for bad balance, getting a little steadier on his feet now as round three begins. Lewis is doing some good boxing, although Oliver McCall is not putting his punches together. He's trying more to psych this man out rather than whip him. Are you suggesting, George, that he's trap shooting, looking to lay a trap and just land that big right again? More than anything else, trying to uh, wait around and fights go quick, you know. Another uppercut lands. 
for Lewis. Finding, as George Foreman points out, opportunities to box effectively. Yeah, that's what he want to do is to box, move around, save his power for when he sees something perfect. Oliver McCall has got to mix it up and make this boy get wild with him. If he can make Lewis get wild, then he can get that right hand in again. But as long as Lewis is able to stand flat-footed, flick the jab, and keep McCall at a distance like this, there isn't much Oliver can do. That's true. Three minutes goes by real quick. You got to remember, Oliver McCall was a bit smaller the first time they fought, so that right hand came, was delivered a lot quicker. Interesting to see what kind of stamina McCall has tonight if this goes into the later rounds. Remember, he was in rehab for one of his multiple substance abuse problems at the beginning of his training camp. Lewis now landing hard right hands from over the top behind the jab. Now Lewis, if he wants, he can just do that all night. Why change anything? McCall is doing the acting job because he can't do anything else. McCall starting to look around and mug for the crowd as though he's either bored or frustrated. One thing he's not doing for the moment is winning rounds. He's hardly fighting right now. He has so much confidence in his stamina. He's been in with some of the good boxers before, and later on, they wear down. Good combination by Lewis. Left hook and a right hand over the top. McCall dancing as if to say, you can't hurt me. But Lewis is piling up points easily against a two-passive Oliver McCall. That's what you want your fighter to do. Win every round. If a knockout comes, good. That was almost a two-point round. Lewis was so dominant. I gave you two rounds, I gave him another one. So you got two rounds in the bank, okay? Right. I gave you one another one to him, okay? Working the jab, feeling all right? Just take your time, son, and start ripping him to the body a little bit now, okay? But you have not pushed him back in him. You want to start pushing McCall him McCall is doing a very strange thing here, folks. He's walking around. He's wandering around the ring. He hasn't gone to his corner, and he's trying to figure out what's gone wrong, why he's not into this fight. The people in his corner are looking at him and wondering what's going on. And you can see the disgust on George Benton's face. I wonder if that's against the rules or not. Harold, you know anything about that? You're supposed to stay in the corner, George, but I tell you the truth, he doesn't have to sit down. You don't sit down, for example. I started but you to are say. supposed to stay in the corner. You can't wander out into the middle of the ring. The referee should have definitely got it back to a corner. Oliver McCall threw a total of 15 punches, according to our punch stat numbers in round number three. And here he takes a hard right hand to begin the fourth. So whether McCall is disgusted with himself, his corner, the referee, Lennox Lewis, the whole occupation of boxing, who knows? Lewis seems unsure what to do as McCall occasionally looks away from him and invites him to attack. This is a bizarre scene. Bizarre scene. What should Lewis do, George? Well, you got to stay within the rules. Don't break any rules by hitting your guy behind the back or something like that. Then you can get yourself in trouble. It, Sooner looks, or later. it looks like he's quitting, and I'm surprised that Mills Lane, in his 19th heavyweight championship fight, hasn't gone over and said something to him about, you got to fight, Oliver, you got to fight. That's what Mills should be saying to him because he's not doing anything. This is one of the strangest things I've ever seen in a championship fight. Well, on Tuesday of this and week. And he's shaking his head at George as if to say, there's something wrong, I got nothing here. Unless he's playing fight. the greatest game of possum I ever saw. Right hand by Lewis. McCall able to take it even though he had his hands down. It's got to be a difficult thing for Lewis. He's aiming punches at a sitting duck here. I don't know if the referee should let a fight like this go on. I mean, this is not what audience yeah, now, now Mills Lane is going to call time and have a conversation with McCall. Alex! Alex! McCall has thrown one punch in the round. This is a bizarre display. I personally have never seen anything like it. He's not even looking at Lewis as he walks away. As far as you know. All right, let's go to Larry Merchant, who's with George Benton in McCall's corner. Larry? This man's a mind is going. George, you're saying that you think something he snapped in there? Well, you're watching it. You, you ever seen anything like this in your life? Never. 
Did you see any sign of anything wrong with him during training? No, never. Did you see any sign of him, of anything in the dressing room before the fight? No, nothing. Do you think the referee should stop this fight because he's not fighting back? I won't, I'm in this man's corner. I won't voice no opinion on that, but although you see this man, he's still there. All he's got to do is fight. Thank you, George. Well, Oliver McCall's been talking religion this week, saying that he has found God in his life. That's his new mechanism for attempting to deal with all the problems that have haunted him in the past. Tuesday, he told a group of boxing writers, I'm going to retire after this fight. It's not godly to train for a long period of time to go out and try to hurt another man. Then Wednesday, at a pre-fight news conference, he said, no, no, I'm not going to retire. I will keep fighting after I win the championship. But something interferes with Oliver McCall's motivation as think, round four closes here. Jim, I think this fight should be stopped right now. Yeah, the fight shouldn't go on. I wouldn't want to see I mean, this like is a farce. What is the old saying? The first time is tragedy. The second time is farce. There's something wrong with Oliver McCall. He's near tears now. He doesn't really want to fight. He's crying in his corner. I've never seen anything like this. He's overwhelmed with some sort of emotion. Don't do this to yourself. Don't do this to yourself, man. Come on, come on, come on. Thanks a lot. He doesn't want to fight. Come on, sit down, man. Sit down. I'll have to sit down. Now, you want to fight? Huh? You don't want to fight? Yeah, you want to fight. Come on, man. Come on, come on. 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 You can win this fight. Come on, take his boy out here. Hey, man. Go in there. Go in fight this fuck. This is for your daughter, man. Take this guy out here. You heard Mills Lane say, do you want to fight? Reluctantly, it seems, he said yes but it doesn't show on his face. McCall's share of tonight's purse amounts to close to $3 million. If I was in the commission here, I would hold that, that purse up. This is a disgrace. It's almost like you're watching a man come apart at the seams. Well, right in a life filled eyes. with crises, Oliver McCall is having one right now before the eyes of the world. And it's placed Lennox Lewis in an awfully difficult and awkward position. Lewis doing what he has to do. This isn't right. You wonder how much longer Mills Lane will allow this to go on. And that's, that's gonna be it. Well, I've seen some strange things in boxing. That is surely one of the strangest. With a whimper, not a bang. Lennox Lewis has just become the WBC World Heavyweight Champion for the second time in his career. Mark Ratner, Executive Director of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, joins us now at ringside. Mark, your take on what you just saw. We are going to hold up his purse. We are not going to let him catch his letter of credit. We're very upset with what happened. We'll have a full investigation. He will not get paid tonight. It did not appear as though he wanted to fight. That is correct. We're very upset. Thank you very much, Mark. So now Larry Merchant goes into the ring, and George, that was painful. Yeah, but this guy's had a painful life for the last few moments. He's been under counseling for drugs, and believe me, there's a great a lot of young people in that fix, in the same fix he's in. Someone's going to have to help him. The last him. thing he needs in his life is the pressure of boxing right now. Yeah, that's a lot of pressure, and the crowd is cheering, and you really, I wanted to just get up there and embrace him and let him know it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay because what do you what do you go from here? Let's hope let's hope he can pr continue to pursue the path of religion in, in which he now believes, and uh, that that can be the reconstructive mechanism in his life. Yeah, believe me, there are a group of people in this country who's in the same shape he is, and they really need us. And this guy is in bad shape, and he needs us. And I don't know. I'm sorry to see the boxing crowd see something like that because. Maybe they're not un they're unfamiliar with it, but we see this every day in the lives of our, our young people who got mixed up, got on the wrong side of the, uh, the track, and they can't get back on. George, you're a devout Christian. Your belief in God is the central motivating factor day to day in your life. Has it ever made you feel like you did not want to box? No, this is a job. It's a profession. Remember, there are people out there who, are in his condition, who are airline pilots, stewardesses, stewards. You name them, we do everything, and so. They've probably felt like that. I don't want to go to work today. 
Let's go to Michael Buff for the ring announcers for the official particulars. Ladies and gentlemen, here at the Las Vegas Hilton, referee Mills Lane has to call a halt to this bout. It comes as Oliver McCall refuses to defend himself, referee declaring a technical knockout at 55 seconds of round number five. The winner, and now a two-time WBC heavyweight champion of the world, the pride of Great Britain, Lennox New. A stunned crowd at ringside here at the Las Vegas Hilton. You heard the boos. You saw some people throwing cups of ice and beverages on McCall and his entourage as they left the ring. Greg Page removing the gloves from McCall's hands and McCall discussing with bystanders over there whatever it was that motivated him to stop fighting in the middle of his proposed championship battle with Lennox Lewis. Larry Merchant stands by with the two-time WBC heavyweight titleist. All right, Lennox, congratulations, I guess. What did you see? Well, I think the main thing is, you know, I went out there and just asserted myself. I didn't allow him to come in too much. I think he found it difficult to get through, through my jab. I was just playing with him with my jab, just popping it out, waiting for him to make a move. And, I, you know, when he started walking away, I thought it was a joke at first. I thought he was trying to gnaw me into something. But then, you know, I kept on going. So I just picked up the pace and just continued. Do you on. think that his idea was to come out, try to land one more big right on you and end it? Otherwise, he really didn't want to fight? Well, you know, the first time we met, I realized that it was a lucky punch, and I told the world that it was a lucky punch, because he doesn't have a, a, enough skill that can contend with me. The main thing, I just went out there and just, you know, put my jab out, and he couldn't really contend with that, and, you know, basically gave up. Do you think he was having some kind of a breakdown in the ring? I don't know. I wore these white trunks for a reason, but, you know, one... What, what was the reason? Oh, just to, look, just to look good and have a mental kind of uh, stress on him, you know, seeing me come out as a, you know, as a gladiator in, a, in some sense. What do you want to do next? Next, I want to get in the ring as soon as possible and just continue the, the winning uh, success that I'm having. Thank you very much, Lennox you. Lewis. And now I'm with Emmanuel Stewart. Emmanuel, first I have to ask you about Oliver McCall since you trained him for the last fight. Tell us what you thought happened. I think uh, he almost got like a miniature breakdown emotionally. Uh, he was very frustrated. I think the size of Lennox totally had him in awe. And, and after trying to get in, Lennox did what we told him. It was not a hard jab. It was just a continual, like a range ranger jab to just keep him at a distance and keep him frustrated. And we figured about seven, eight rounds we would knock him out. But he just got totally frustrated because he could not effectively get in. And I think. It just got to a point, being that he's such a high, strong, emotional guy, that he just said, forget it. Did he, in some sense, revert to being a sparring partner after that? I think to a certain degree he did resemble a lot of the sparring partners that we worked with. And we had watched a lot of George Foreman's films, believe it or not, and we went back to just use that. We call this a all the time steadily filling him with a left hand and being ready to take a step back with your right foot as soon as he comes forward. And it worked. And mentally, it just broke him down. He was so, when a guy is really charged up and wired up the way that he is, it's very easy to confuse him. I recall, and I mentioned earlier, that after the first, then just before the first fight, he, he seemed wired up beyond being wired up. We thought he was having a breakdown before that fight. Yeah. He came in in a much more low-key way this time. What, what did that signal to you? He could never attain what he was that night. That's one of those uh, unbelievable highs. They tried to do it, and that was why Lennox's orders were to not do nothing aggressive. The first round was to clinch him, wrestle him up, throw him down to kind of slow him down. A lot of what Evander did to Tyson. When a guy is really wired up, you wrestle him and do different things to kind of slow him down and get him out of his room. And after he got out of that charged up mode, it was just a matter of time before he just got frustrated and said, I quit. What did you tell Lennox between rounds? Because certainly I, you probably have never had a fighter faced with that situation. I thought that Oliver was up to a trick. He was just trying to sucker punch to get Lennox to come in. So the first round that he did that, I was a little cautious. But the, after the, the last time I saw it, I said, just go out and charge him and put a combination of punches together, and he's going to quit. This, this question. I've heard stories of uh, Emmanuel that after this fight, 
you may go to train Mike Tyson. Would you comment on that? I'm with Lennox Lewis. I'm everybody saying this but me. So you haven't negotiated no, and you are you are Lennox Lewis's trainer. I've still got work to do with Lennox. We got a fight, I guess, in May against uh, Akinwanda or whatever, and then hopefully after that the Come fight, on, no, Holyfield, oh, probably uh, whoever, uh, Tyson. Thank you very much. Back to you, Jim and George. All right, let's briefly take a look now at the moment at which Mills Lane elected to stop the 19th heavyweight championship fight of his refereeing life. It was an all too anticlimactic moment for. I'm trying to see a monitor here. An all too anticlimactic moment for the crowd, which paid big money for tickets to the fight, and a dangerous moment as well. Lennox Lewis was doing what he had to do, trying to land big right hands against an Oliver McCall who was barely defending himself. And Mills Lane at that point had seen enough. And now we bring you live to ringside with the referee himself, Mr. Let's Get It On, Mills Lane. Mills, you've, you've had a lot of tough assignments in boxing. That had to be one of the toughest. It was amazing. I think something happened. I think he suffered some type of an emotional breakdown. It looked like he was crying. His lip was quivering. And then I thought at first he was playing possum. And the, then he, he just wouldn't defend himself. And, I mean, it was just no use for it to go on. Was it painful for you and a little scary to watch Lewis throwing those big right hands against a guy who was barely defending himself? Especially when he had his hand down with no chance to defend himself and didn't even want to. He looked like he almost won to get knocked out. When you went to McCall between rounds four and five and asked him if he wanted to continue fighting, did he seem to be indicating to you that he thought he did? Yeah, he said, I got to fight. I want to fight. I got to fight. But then he came out and did uh, exactly the opposite. Now, you could have disqualified him, it seems to me, for walking around the ring between rounds and not going into his corner. Well, I don't know. You can, you can stand up. You're supposed to be in your corner when the bell rings, but you can stand up. So I don't think that's a round for disqualification. Uh -huh. Did you ever consider asking his corner, what the heck is going on with this guy and what should I do? I didn't ask him what I should do. I don't want the corner telling me, but I did go to the corner and say, what's wrong with your kid? Something's wrong here. Well, Mills, I think you come out of it unscathed because nobody got hurt. And uh, let's just hope that the next heavyweight championship fight you do has a little more action than this one. Thanks, Jim, very much. All right. Mills Lane, one of the greats of his trade. Now let's turn our attention back to George Foreman. And uh, George, it seemed to me that Oliver was trying to send a message to you even during his unusual performance here. He was looking at you from time to time with a look that seemed to say, I'm not sure whether I want to be here. What did you make of it? I signaled to him for the, to keep boxing. This is your sport. This is a livelihood. We've got kids to feed. Don't ever put this sport to shame. But he looked at me as if to say, mm -mm, I'm not going to do that. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. And so I figured he had some sort of breakdown today, and he's going to really need to be embraced by his family now. It's going to be hard to live with something like that. A lot of us felt that uh, Lennox Lewis would benefit enormously from a stirring win here tonight. You know, if he could perform well, attack Oliver McCall, knock out the guy who had knocked him out. Does he gain anything from this? No doubt about it. He was able to keep him at bay with that left jab and make it look easy. Whenever Oliver McCall tried to throw a right hand, he just waved it off. It frustrated him. That was part of the reason that he just literally quit. What do you make of the heavyweight division these days, George? Of course, you're back as an active fighter now after having taken a little bit of time away from the ring. You've got uh, Lewis, who holds a championship belt. Holyfield has a couple of them. Akinwande is seen by his promoter, Don King, as a factor in all this. What do you make of the heavyweight division right now? Well, because of television, a lot of people didn't know previously in the past that boxing has always been like this. It's nothing new. It's the home of the good, bad, and the ugly. <laughs> but look, the fighters are getting into the ring. They're making a living. They don't have to fight a lot of fights to get a big purse now. They don't have to end up walking on their heels and things of that nature. So as a rule, boxing is in a good state. Some of the boxers, they're not in a, such a good state, though. Well, one of them tonight, obviously, was Oliver McCall. And we told you about the personal problems that have dogged him throughout his life. Obviously, as I told you before the fight, those are bigger issues in his life than whether he wins a boxing match. Larry Merchant's been trying to get into McCall's dressing room to find out what's going on there. Let's see what he's got. Larry? Jim, I've been, Jim, I've been trying to get in without much success. Commission doctors have been talking to McCall. We don't know the results of those talks. We've tried to get people in the camp of Oliver McCall to talk to us, but nobody is talking right now. We have heard from George Benton before. It's as strange to him as, it any, as anyone else. Here, one moment, and Mark, Mark Ratner will be with us, Mark, of the commission. 
Mark, what can you tell us that you didn't know 10 minutes ago? Uh, nothing right now. I'm absolutely shocked. Uh, I've never seen anything like this in, in my uh, 15 years in boxing, and uh, we're very upset as a commission, and we are going to have a full investigation and, and withhold any money that he would have coming tonight. What legally can you withhold money, and in what basis? My attorney generals are uh, right now with us for failure to honestly compete. He did not compete in an honest manner in our in, in my opinion, and we are going to do that. And that's in the rule book? Yes, it is. And so can you withhold the entire purse of $3 million to everybody in this camp? What we're going to do is have a hearing. We'll hold the money until we, we find out exactly what happened tonight. But there will be, he'll have his uh, day in court. Is there any precedent for you actually withholding the money and not paying him and giving the money back to the promoter and or the public in some way? Uh, there's precedent we've had. We've had fine people before. I don't believe we've ever find anybody the complete purse like this, uh, but we have to have a hearing. So it's possible that well, there will be a major fine on Oliver McCall. Yes, there will be. There will be. I mean, he'll have his day in court, but there could be a major fine. Yes. And as far as the purse is concerned, is this a legal matter that's very difficult for you to adjudicate? Well, I have I have my two attorney general deputies here right now, and we are discussing it as we speak. Thanks very much, Thank you, Jim. And a final look at Oliver McCall, one thing which cannot be denied. Uh, this is a man in severe personal turmoil and stress. In no way was this an act. Oliver McCall would have had to have been an Academy Award caliber actor to have fooled anybody with the kind of stress and turmoil that he was undergoing tonight. Obviously, George, that was entirely real. And at this point, uh, regardless of which side of the fence you're on, I think you got to feel sympathy for a guy like that. A lot of sympathy because not only he's just probably tonight the, uh, the standard bearer for the condition of a lot of people. Really, we're going to have to stop and think about what we're going to do for these people. They're out there. They don't know what to do with their lives. They, they want to go to work in the morning, but they just don't know what to do. And McCall has problems, and we, we just can't walk away from it. And it's, it's entered into the ring with us now. Uh, Incidentally, we have, to, we have to find some remedies here. Yeah, we, we tried to talk to uh, both Oliver McCall and his promoter, Don King, without success. Uh, I mentioned before the fight that if Lewis got a victory here, he might ultimately be headed toward a uh, matchup with Riddick Bo. A lot of people have talked about that matchup for a long time. Obviously, Bo is an entirely different kind of boxing commodity now than was the case six or seven months ago. How would you see a battle between Lewis and Bo at this point? I think Riddick Bo, if he takes him about, about a year or so off, come back rejuvenated, he can whip this guy. Mm -hmm. Riddick Bo can, where a lot of other guys can't because he's tall and he's brave. And that's what you're going to need to fight someone like uh, Yeah, Bo and Galata are really the two guys who are big enough to fight Lennox Lewis on his own terms. Right? I don't know about Galata. This guy may, he may want to have a child or two first before he goes <laughs> back to Galata. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous, George. All right. Well, thanks very much. Pleasure as always. Larry, what does this do to boxing's heavyweight division? Well, I don't know. Maybe Lennox Lewis will now join the Foreign Legion. <laughs> and in that way, he can meet... Uh, Get himself Bo, ready for Bo, yeah. Right, on the shores of Tripoli. Mm -hmm. um, you know, tragedy and farce. And nobody really has any answers. The crowd around us is as befuddled as you no doubt are. Um, I've often called boxing the theater of the unexpected, and I think this time we went beyond the theater of unexpected. Indeed.